My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Grab a seat. Amen. Woo. Amen. Good morning, City Light. Morning, City Light. Thank you. Hey, so glad you guys are here. My name is Gavin. I'm one of the pastors, and God is here today. He promised us uh, he is alive. He is present. God speaks through his word and through his spirit, and uh, he's going to speak today. And so I hope you came with uh, just open hearts, ready to receive from God, not from me, not from a speech, but from God who speaks to us through his Bible and alarm system. So could be a long sermon if that doesn't get shut off pretty soon. They don't teach you what to do in these moments in seminary. Just wing it. Is that, is that inside or outside? Yeah, whatever. Christian. We're going to preach the Bible. Amen? Here we go. Let's do it. Someone get on that. Gaby, get that fixed. Somebody. Here we go. Just focus. Spirit of God, please focus our hearts. I want to preach a sermon this morning called... Know that you know that you know, okay? Here's why 1 John is going to tell us that we can know God. It's not only going to tell us that we can know God, it's going to tell us that we can know that we know God. And so I want to preach a sermon to you telling you that you can know that you can know that you can know God. You know? You know? You with me? We know? A lot of knowing in here. And so I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at the first six verses this morning, and I want to talk to us this morning about knowing God, knowing God. Trying to focus, you with me? (laughs) I'm going to tone that out. I got kids. I'm really, this is a spiritual gift God has given me to tone out the noises. Help me now, Jesus. I want to talk to you about knowing God. Okay, Here's here's a very interesting thing about the book of 1 John. Um, 1 John is five chapters long, and it never mentions heaven, at least not in the ESV version that I read. It never mentions heaven. Now, is it not, is heaven not a very central theme to the Christian faith and the Bible? Yes, right? Absolutely. Uh, We all think a lot about heaven because right now we're all alive, at least I think, right? There's an alarm going off. There could be something going on I don't know about, but most of us are alive in this room But we all know in 100 years, probably none of us in this room will be alive, right? There is an expiration date for each one of us that is coming, and we all want to know whether we're a Christian or not, or no matter what our worldview is, what happens to me when I die, right? There's this immaterial part of me that thinks and feels and senses and relates and and seems to be a part of me that's different from my body, yet dependent on my body and what happens to what the Bible calls my soul when I die. Do I go to heaven? Do I go to hell? Do I go to purgatory? Am I reincarnated as a dolphin or a dog? Or do I just float around the earth like Patrick Swayze with his arms around Demi Moore at the the pottery wheel? Everyone born after 1990 is like, what's he talking about? Just don't worry about it, okay? It's just a secret for us older folks in the room. What happens to us? Now, I want to go uh, on record emphatically saying heaven is real. The Bible very much speaks to um, a place in which those who know God through Jesus will be present with God apart from the body, Paul says, and we call this place heaven. It's the dwelling place for those who know God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. That is called heaven, but John talks a lot about what Jesus has done for us, the salvation he has won for us, but he doesn't primarily talk about a destination to which we arrive when we die, does he? He actually talks about a present tense reality that we experience in the here and the now. 
And what he calls it is knowing God. Knowing God. And that includes heaven. So it's an experience that we get to enjoy now, but that we get to walk in after our body expires. And we call that heaven, but it starts now, and he calls it knowing God. Our author, John, wrote another book of the, of the Bible, one of the uh, Gospels, and he said this. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I said, not him. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I don't know who fixed that. Wish we could rewind and start over. God, focus our hearts, knowing you, eternal life. Okay, John 17, verse 3, he says this, and this is eternal life. What is it? That they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So John says eternal life is to know God. What that means, City Light, is we can know God. And the question I want all of us to ask ourselves this morning is, do I know God? And the second question is, how do I know if I know God, right? Do I know God, and how do I know if I know God? I ask those questions because those are the questions that our six verses want to answer for us this morning. And so... I just want to be aware of this, so let me say, there might be some people in the room who are Christians who are thinking, oh, this is like the Assurance of Salvation sermon, so I'm glad he's preaching it. You know, maybe there's a non-Christian who's going to get saved today. I'm going to pray for them and kind of cross my arms, but this isn't for me. I want you to know this has vast practical implications for both the Christian and the non-Christian this morning. Assurance of salvation, knowing that we can know that we know God is one of the greatest gifts that God has given to the believer. How else are we going to do battle with a guilty conscience? How else are we going to do battle with fearful anxiety? How else on that last day, in our last moments, will we be able to approach our expiration date with a sense of anticipation, peace, and joy, even as our body gives out on us? The answer is this assurance of salvation. What a gift from God that we can know that we could know. As Christians, we should want to hear it and test it and be sure of it over and over and over and over again. That's why the old saints used to sing about blessed assurance. Who knows the tune? Anybody? Sing it with me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in the blood. Gabe, I think your job is secure. I just don't think you have anything to worry about, okay? Right? Why do we sing that blessed assurance? Jesus is mine. I can know what a foretaste of glory divine. There is nothing more sweet to the Christian's ear than to know that we know God. Amen? Amen. And for the non-Christian in the room or the person who might think, I don't know if I know and I don't know if I know that I can know and how do I know, I would say this. I pray that God would make you uneasy this morning. Not because I don't love you, but because I do love you. Uh, And this is a matter so important that we should not get a good night's rest until we have this settled, do I know God? I listened to my man, Charles Spurgeon, old British preacher. He said it this way. It'll be up on the screen. He said, if any man is not sure that he is in Christ, he ought not to be easy one moment until he is sure. Dear friend, without the fullest confidence as to your saved condition, you have no right to be at ease, and I pray you may never be so. This is a matter too important to be left decided, undecided. Amen? Amen. Amen. Does it get any more basic than this? Do we know God, and how do we know if we know God? And um, I just think the more I live life, the more I realize there's not a lot in life that's for certain. Have you noticed this? The older I get, the more I think the things that I used to thought were so stable and so secure that I could be so sure of suddenly feel a little bit more temporal. And you guys know this, right? Um, I ordered a new iPhone. I have no confidence it's going to show up on the estimated delivery date, right? I'm just not sure of that. It's probably going to come late. The Huskers are, what, 4-0, 3-0, 4-0? I'd like to think we're going to do well. I'm not so sure. I don't have a lot of confidence, right? Maybe some of you guys, it runs a little bit deeper. You had that job that you were so sure was stable, and now you're unemployed, so unprepared for that. That person that said vows before God, saying they would never leave you, they're gone right? Dear family members that have abandoned you, you think, what can I be sure of anymore? What a treat to know God says you can be sure of one thing. You can be assured that you know God and that you will be with him for eternity. I think this could be a good sermon. I don't know. Anyone feeling this? 
I think God's got a good word for us in spite of the siren. So here's what I want to do. I want to start in verse 3. And uh, verse 3 is kind of the hinge verse uh, of everything that God's trying to tell us in these six verses. And so I want to start there, and I want to set up kind of the outline that I'm going to use for the rest of the morning. And uh, that's where I got the title of the verse. And so uh, here's what we're going to do. Verse 3, let me start with the first half. John says this, And by this we know that we have come to know him. All right, this is going to set up my outline. Let me geek out on this word know really quick. I put no in the title three times for a reason. I want us to to know this word no. So the Greek word used here is gnosko. It has a a broad stroke use in the New Testament. Um, uh, And primarily it can mean three different things. Number one, to know something can mean um, to just be assured of it, right? Uh, I, I perceive it to be true. Uh, you know Husker football? Yeah, I know Husker football, right? I'm familiar with it. I know it factually to be true. You know Barack Obama? Yeah, I know Barack Obama. I know who he is. I'm certain of certain things, right? That's the first sense. The Bible uses it in a second sense, which is a lot more exciting, and that's how Adam knew Eve, okay? Amen? You with me? Praise the Lord. And so uh, knowing can be an idiom for marital relations. So when Adam knew Eve in Genesis 4... He was more than just a little familiar with her. He knew her, and nine months later came Cain. And so uh, knowing is for husbands and wives, okay? Single folks, first comes the nuptial, then comes knowing. Got it? Knowing. Okay, that's the second sense the Bible uses the word to know. The third sense um, means to be um, personally acquainted with, to be in relationship with. Right? So in a sense, do I know Barack Obama? Yeah, I know Barack Obama. Do I know him? No. Right? You're laughing. I didn't mean that sense. The third sense, do I know him? Right? But do I in the third sense know Chris Ruska? Yes. I'm personally acquainted with him. I have a relationship with him. And so I, I geek out on that to say that what John is saying here is an amazing claim. He says you can know. That's the first sense. You can be certain of. You can be aware of, you can perceive as factual truth that you know, that's the third sense, a relational connection to an intimacy with, you can be personally acquainted with God. Big claim. And I think there's some folks in the room who might know God in the first sense. You've read some Bible verses, you went to a class, you read a book, you read the blog, you watched the documentary, you know God, but you don't know yet know God. And I want you to know this morning that you can know, third sense, God. How? There's our first point. God's going to tell us in the first two verses, he's going to summarize how it is that we sinful people can know personally acquainted with the God of the universe. So here we go, point one, how do we know God? Let's start in verse one. He says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Okay, God does not like sin. That's when we disobey a holy God, and it's our sin that separates us from God. Sin is the problem for which and by which we don't know God. Adam and Eve knew God intimately in the garden, but it was their sin that broke their fellowship with God. And it's sin that's in each one of us that prevents us from knowing God in an intimate way. So sin is bad. It breaks fellowship with God. It says, but if anyone does sin, okay, that's good news because you might be talking to us. Raise your hand if you sin, if you've ever sinned. Okay, some of you aren't raising your hand. You're now lying, so get your hand up because that was a sin. Okay, now we're all in the same boat here. If anyone does sin, guess who he's talking to? Everyone in the room, here comes the good news. We have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. That's the best P word that you don't know what it means. I'll get to it in a minute. You're going to come to love that word. And not only for ours, or not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Here's what what he's saying here. He's saying we don't know God because we have sin, but here's one of the best words. He says we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, and he is the righteous. An advocate is someone who does for you on your behalf what you couldn't do for yourself. An advocate is a legal proxy by which whatever they accomplish is credited to you. An advocate is someone who steps in and does something for you on your behalf such that it was as if you did it yourself. I read a story about an advocate this week, and it wasn't just a legal advocate. It was kind of a cool advocate. Uh, I saw a link um, uh, to this NBC 
news article about, uh, about a homecoming. And the homecoming was in Grand Prairie High School in Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, last Friday night was their homecoming. And Lillian Skinner is a 17-year-old uh, high school senior at uh, Grand Prairie High School. Now, over the years, Lillian has been the target of a lot of um, uh, harassment and pranking and bullying because of her kind of simple spirit that God has given her and some of her physical features. And so over the years, she hasn't been the popular girl. She's been the picked on girl. And it's continued on into high school, uh, such that just a couple weeks ago, uh, some of the other girls in the high school actually convinced uh, Lillian that she had been nominated in, uh, for the homecoming court. Said your name's on the ballot. In fact, we have a pretty certain chance that you are going to be the homecoming queen. And uh, Lillian was beside herself. She was overwhelmed with joy to think that after all those years, suddenly uh, her classmates loved and approved of her. Uh, well, she didn't know it was a prank. There was another 17-year-old girl at the high school, and her name actually was on the ballot, and her name was Alvarez Martinez. Alvarez was good-looking, she was popular, uh, she was athletic and winsome, and she knew that she had a decent chance at becoming the actual homecoming queen. And so after hearing about the prank with Lillian, Alvarez met with the principal of the school, and she told him, principal, if I win the most votes on that day at the homecoming game, I don't even want to know it. But if I win the votes, I want to immediately pass the crown to Lillian. And so if I've won it, don't call my name. Don't tell anyone about this deal. If it happens that on that day I win, I want you to call her name. And so it was just last Friday at homecoming, Grand Prairie High School, at the football game in front of thousands of people, this Class A school, the entire school and community is looking on. The principal stands up at halftime of the football game and announces to the awaiting crowd, ladies and gentlemen, the 2014 homecoming queen is Lillian Skinner. Yes. How about that? I watched, uh, I watched a video of this online, and it was so cool to see Lillian come forward with tears streaming down her face. So overwhelmed, she was the homecoming queen after all. And in an interview, she was so sweet, she, she pinched herself and said, I just keep pinching myself. I, I think I'm dreaming. This is, I can't believe this is happening. So filled with life and joy. And here's the best part. They interviewed Alvarez, um, and, and it was written down in the news article, and I just copied it here. Here's what Alvarez said. She said, well, for me, I want to say, and I will always say, Lily won. I ran in her place, in her position. That's an advocate. See, Lily had an advocate before the Grand Prairie High School, and her name was Alvarez. Alvarez did for Lily what she could never do for herself. Not smart enough, popular enough, good-looking enough, but someone stepped in and said, I'm going to do for you what you could never do for yourself. And what verse 1 is saying is that before God, we have an advocate. Jesus stepped in and won the crown of righteousness for us on our behalf before the God of heaven. And I love this. Let me break this down for you because I think this is one of the most undercommunicated and under misunderstood, underunderstood truths of what Jesus has done for us. I think we know very well kind of one side of the salvation that Jesus has won for us, and that is what he did on the cross. And so most of us are aware uh, that Jesus is a representative on the, on the cross. In other words, when we place our faith in Jesus, our sins are transferred to him, and he takes our punishment for us on the cross. That's what the next verse calls propitiation, a sin substitute, and that is great news. That's a great P word that we should all learn, propitiation. He takes the punishment for my sins away, but that's only half. Our verse is telling us that he was not only our representative on the cross, but right now Jesus is your advocate. He is your representative before God the Father right now. So that right now when God the Father looks to those whom have placed their faith in Jesus, he not only sees you, he sees the very righteousness, the very crown of his son that he had earned for you. Let me put it another way. I growing up and kind of as a new Christian, I heard this illustration quite a bit that I think is helpful but incomplete. And it went like this. When you become a Christian, it's like you've got a piece of paper and your sins are written on this paper and, and you hand your sins to Jesus and he gives you back a blank slate. He gives you back a blank piece of paper. 
Uh, that's in part true, but I would say what he gives you is not a blank slate. It's not a clean slate. He gives you the very crown of righteousness. He gives you back a slate that's full and rich with the very identity of God so that whatever Jesus is to the Father, so now too you are to the Father. Do you catch that? So who is Jesus to the Father? He's his beloved son. Guess what? Galatians 4 says... We are no longer slaves, but we are sons. Because you have an advocate, you don't have a blank slate. You have sonship. You have a new last name. It's Christian. You're in the family of God so that God treats you like a loving father does his child. And we have access to God like a child does his loving father. That's not a blank slate. We're not back to moral neutral, right? We're a beloved child. Who is Jesus to the father? Uh, it says that he's an heir to the kingdom of God. Guess what? Romans 8 says that if we're adopted in the family of God, we are now an heir. God wrote us into the will so that everything that is, God will want, is God's will one day be ours to enjoy with God in the kingdom of God for eternity. You didn't get a blank slate. Your name got written onto the inheritance will and given to you. What is Jesus to the Father? He's his closest friend. For eternity past, they, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, had perfect fellowship and friendship. They like each other. They're for each other. John 15 says we are no longer Jesus' enemies, but we are his friend. City Light, we have been called friends of God so that God no longer, um, you're no longer his enemy. He doesn't just begrudgingly love you because he has to has to, in Christ, because of our advocate, he both loves you and he likes you. Do you know that? If your faith is in Jesus, God enjoys being in friendship with you. God likes you. You don't just have a blank slate. You have the very identity of Jesus written onto you, mapped onto your heart, and God is your friend. You can know him because Jesus Christ is your advocate. This is great news. Let me go back a little bit. This, I, I read this this week, and this didn't make my notes, but I want to share this with you because it blew my mind, this whole idea of Jesus being our advocate. Chris la preached last, verse, uh, last week, uh, John 1, verse 9, which says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so I've always wondered, why is it just that God would forgive our sins? Isn't it merciful that God would forgive our sins? No, here's why. Jesus, as our advocate before the Father right now, is not pleading for mercy. He's not asking the Father to be merciful for you. He's demanding justice. Why? Because Jesus Christ, your advocate, was the propitiation. He took your penalty for you. And so when you sin, it's not like Jesus is appealing to God's patience. Would you just let him go one more time? Would you just uh, have mercy on him? No, he's pleading justice. Jesus, on your behalf as your advocate, is saying to the Father, you cannot judge him because you already judged me in his place. It would be unjust for you to treat him any or her any way other than your perfect love that you've given to me. Do you see that? Is that not great news? What does that mean? That means you will never grow the patience of God too thin that he's going to give up on you. Because God's no longer giving you mercy, he's giving you justice. He's giving you what Jesus earned and deserved for you, and it is just, and God is just. He has to, as it were, treat you as his beloved child. You are secure in that. Do you see the richness of this idea of our advocate and our propitiation? We can know God as a child, as an heir, as a friend, secure in that identity. Let me ask you, friends, do you know God? Maybe you've wondered, you've speculated, have I done enough? Am I good enough? You're asking the wrong questions. The right question is, do you have an advocate? If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you know God, and his love is on you as though you were Jesus Christ himself. Not because of what you have done, but he has stepped in like Alvarez for Lily. He did it in your place. Do you know God? If not, you can know God today. You don't need to walk a line, pray a prayer. You just need to, in your heart, confess, God, I need you to be my advocate, Jesus Christ. Do for me what I could never do for myself. And by faith, we have an advocate.
Here's the greatness of this invitation. Verse 2 says, um, he, he's a propitiation not only for our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. I want you to know that what he is saying there is not that this kind of just universally applies to everyone in the whole universe. What he's saying is that the invitation of this forgiveness knows no bounds. What he's saying is the invitation of the gospel is for the whole world. It doesn't matter your nationality, your race, your age, your gender, your income, your present sins, your past sins, what you think your sexual orientation is, your church record, your criminal record. He's saying none of that. The invitation is for the whole world to receive the grace of God and know God through Jesus Christ. Do you know him? The invitation is for you and for the whole world. We can know God. And now what he's going to say in verses 3 and following is that when you know God by faith in Jesus, it's going to start to do some things in your life. You can't have a radical encounter like that and have it bear no effectiveness or change in your life. It's going to start to change you. It's going to start to do some things in you. And so we're going to get to the second point of the sermon, which is how do I know that I know God? How can I know? Well, thank you, God. He tells us. Look at verse 3. He says, and by this we know... There's our word that we have come to know him. How? If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Listen to this. What John is saying right here is that loving relationship will always produce obedience. When you know God, it will change your life in practical and tangible ways. Let me be very careful. Listen to what he's not saying. He's not saying obedience to God produces loving relationship with God. Okay, you see the difference? That's legalism. That's in every way antithetical to the gospel. He's not saying obedience to God produces loving relationship with God. It's the other way. He says loving relationship with God will produce in you obedience to God. And so obedience doesn't earn God's love, but it does start to give evidence that we have experienced the love of God. So listen, we don't obey God out of fear that we might lose the love of God. We obey God because we know that in Christ as our advocate, we never could lose the love of God anyway. I love and serve my wife, not because I'm fearful that she might leave me, but because she has vowed to never leave me. And that motivates me to want to love and serve her. And likewise, when you know God, you'll look at Jesus Christ and you'll say, Look at the love that God has put on me at such an incredible price. How could I dare sin against a love like that? You see that? Now, let me be clear. What what John is not saying is that you will have faultless obedience, okay? You need to go back about four verses, because just before this, he said, if anyone says they have no sin, they're a liar. You're deceiving yourself, okay? So he's not demanding perfect obedience. If you know God, you will never sin. But what he is saying is there will be a new trajectory to your life. There will be some evidence, right? As you love God, you will actually start to hate sin. And though in seasons you will still fall into sin, you will no longer celebrate your sin, you will be grieved by your sin. And like Chris preached, you will confess your sin and run to Jesus and no longer celebrate your sin and run to it. And you enter the battle of your life, that tension in your soul, what Paul says in Romans 7, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. And you feel that tension in your life, and as you love God, you tend towards obedience. And so very simply, what What John is saying, if you want to know that you know him, look at your life. Are some things starting to change? Your behavior, your obedience will kind of show you whether or not something has actually happened in here. So here's an illustration. Think about the speedometer in your car. How do I know how fast I'm moving forward? Well, I see the needle in my speedometer going up. Now, is that needle the thing that pushes my car forward down the road? No. The engine does that, right? The pedal does that. And so I don't just manually try to push up the speedometer. My car won't go anywhere. That's what he's saying. Look to the evidences of your life. And if if the engine, the love of God, has taken root, you're going to start to see the needle of obedience going up. And the claims of your life will either be confirmed or contradicted by the conduct of your life. 
What a gift of God to know that we can know, to give us some tangible things that we can examine and look at. Uh, to give you another example, my son, who is now five, he turned five on uh, Thursday, but on Wednesday night, we were playing in the living room, and he was excited for his birthday and all wound up, and we're wrestling and playing, and out of nowhere, he pulls his T-shirt up over the back of his head. I can't do it, but he, he brought it up to like here, and his face is still exposed in the hole, and he put his arms up like this and said, Dad, I'm an alien from a distant planet, you know, and We've never watched an alien movie. I didn't even know he knew this idea of aliens, so I admire his creativity. But he said, I'm an alien from a distant planet. Now, to everyone in the room, it was very clear that his claim was not true, right? Why? Uh, I've observed his conduct for the last five years. He eats like a human being, right? He sleeps like a human being. He develops like a human being. He interacts like a human being. So when he makes the claim, I'm an alien, we go, no, you're not, right? <laughs> the conduct of your life contradicts your claim. And that's very simply what John is telling us. He's saying, listen, if you know God, over time it's going to be obvious. You're going to start to want to obey God more and more because love motivates obedience, Love motivates obedience. City Light, I want you to know this is, this is an incredible gift of God. I think wrong, wrongly understood, we, we could hear this passage and think, is God just trying to like ratchet down the guilt so that we will obey him? I would say it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. This is God out of love for us, kindly caring for us, telling us, I want you to know that you can know. And the way that you can know is by observing the actions, attitudes, and behaviors of your life and ask yourself, is there evidence that I know God? And so I want to ask you guys, right, that we would examine our lives. This is a great gift of God. We can know that we can know. And so I would just ask you, is the needle of obedience in your life rising? Uh, maybe you've been a Christian for a week, a month, a decade, maybe the majority of your life. I would ask you, over time, are you seeing evidences of the grace of God? Are your actions, attitudes, and behaviors becoming more in line with those of Jesus or different? Um, out of love for Jesus, do you tend to obey his commandments? Though not perfectly, but do you tend towards obedience? Right? Uh, Jesus said that um, uh, we need to forgive those who hurt us. We might not be batting a thousand, but over time, uh, are you able to forgive those who have sinned against you. He says that we should turn from lust, though maybe not perfectly, but over time, are you tending to turn away from lust and sexual sin? Uh, Jesus says that, uh, that we're to store up treasures in heaven and not on earth, though not perfectly, but over time, have you noticed that money and material wealth is, is loosening its grip on your life and not tightening it? Are you seeing the needle of obedience starting to go up in your life? And if so... If you can say, man, in my heart, I have full faith in my advocate, Jesus Christ, and over time in my life, I'm seeing evidence of that, then celebrate that. Blessed assurance, Jesus is yours. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, right? What a great peace. And if you're saying, man, I don't know. I don't know if I have any tangible evidence in my life. I don't know if my confidence really is in my advocate. Gavin, where do I turn? What do I do if I'm sure? Let me show you where because our, our text tells us, look again at verse 5. It says, whoever keeps his word, that's the barometer, that's the speedometer. How do we get there? In him truly the love of God is perfected. And so if we're not keeping his word, where do we turn? We turn back to his love. Right? We don't just focus on the speedometer and kind of break out the plexiglass and, and try to push that speedometer needle up. We're not going to get anywhere. Instead, we focus on the engine, back to the love of God. And so I would say this. If your lifestyle is marked by continual, willful disobedience to God and it doesn't bother you, it's not that you're focusing on God's grace and forgiveness and love too much, but too little. I would invite you to come back to the love of God. It says, when the love of God is perfected in us, when we understand it, enjoy it, experience it, live from it, it produces in us a lifestyle of obedience to Jesus. And so it's not that you understand his grace and forgiveness too much, but too little. And so I would say, man, preach the gospel to yourself and believe the good news of the gospel. 
Let me remind you, City Light, we have an advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who has done before the Father what we could never do, who earned our very crown of righteousness for us, and he's given it to us as a great gift, that which we could never do. And the invitation this morning, if you don't know that you know God, the invitation is not to clean up your life, is not to get yourself right, but it's to receive by grace the crown that Jesus has earned, that you would trust him as your advocate and your propitiation, that you would place your faith in him and know God. And for the Christians in the room who have trusted Christ, Man, I want this to define you and us and our church culture, this great assurance that we can have. That Jesus Christ is our advocate, and in him we know God. And he's not calling us to do more or try harder, but to open the eyes of our heart to see what Jesus has done and tried for us, and to find our full assurance that we are in him and he is in us, and he is perfecting that through obedience and life change. Amen? This morning, uh, we're going to respond to this message by taking communion. And and communion is really a gift of God. It's a reminder of our advocate and our propitiation. It's a reminder as we take the bread that it was Jesus' body that was hung on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins and broken for us. Uh, As we take that and we dip it in the juice, it's a reminder of the blood of Jesus that was spilled out so that we could be forgiven of our sins and so that we could know God. And just as we have the physical elements with us to eat and to drink, it's a reminder that God is with us. He wasn't just a dying Savior, he is a doing Savior, a living Savior who stands between us and the Father advocating on our behalf justice. Treat them justly as your child. What a gift from God. Uh, If you're new to City Light, we're going to have communion servers there and kind of across the front. And then new this week, we're going to have some communion servers in the back. And so the band is going to play. Uh, You're free to get up at any time and come forward to take communion or back. And uh, communion is for anyone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their advocate. If you trust him, you believe in him, you're welcome to the table. And uh, so the communion servers will actually break the bread for you. They've washed their hands, germphobes, so don't freak out. They're going to break it for you. You take it, you dip it in the juice, partake of it that way, remembering the body and blood of Jesus And uh, then you can return to your seat. Additionally, as always, we're going to have a a team of prayer volunteers in the back. Uh, They're there to pray with you, pray for you. You might think, man, I'm not sure that I'm sure. I would love for someone to pray with me and for me that I could be sure they would love to pray with you. If there's anything going on in your life, uh, let's just invite God to, to work in that. And so I'll pray, the band will play, and then we will take communion. Jesus, we thank you um, that you are our advocate. You are our advocate. You are our propitiation at the cross where you died for our sins. And in this moment, you are pleading our case for the Father, justice, uh, that we could be your children, your heirs, and your friends. Jesus, thank you that you did for us what we could never do for ourselves. God, would you work that out in our hearts that we would be sure that we know that we know that we know you. Um, It's all about Jesus and not what we have done. So make that real in our lives, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.